Welcome to The Swing of Things with Amanda Krause. Our podcast covers all things rowing within the United States and is produced by Row 360. I'm your host, Amanda Kraus. In this episode, I'm joined by three members of the U.S. Rowing Athlete Council, Chair Sarah Hendershot, Vice Chair Dariusha Shagai, and Secretary Grace Latz. The Athlete Council acts as a liaison between national team athletes and the board and staff of U.S. Rowing. They address confidential athlete issues and provide athlete feedback to the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. So let's get started. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, on this podcast, Ariush and Grace and Sarah. Good to see you all. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So we're really happy to have you here this evening to talk about uh, the Athlete Council and want to spend a little bit of time for our listeners getting to know the three of you, and then also getting to know the Athlete Council. And, and what does that mean? Uh, who's on it? Uh, why is it important? So lots of, lots of questions for you all. So let's just jump right in. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to ask you to kick this off as the chair of the Athlete Council. Can you just give the, the, you know, the overview of what is this and who are all of you? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Sarah Hendershot. Um, I was on the 2011 world championship team that won gold in the women's four. And then I was on the 2012 Olympic team and came in fourth in the women's pair. Um, I'm now serving a lot of different roles within us rowing. It's been almost 10 years since my last big international competition. So it's been fun now to get involved on the other side of this all, but I serve as a representative of athletes on the board of directors. I also am our U.S. rowing AAC representative to the USOPC, which means that I'm kind of the liaison between U.S. rowing and the USOPC. And I'm also, as you just mentioned, the chair of our newly formed athlete council at U.S. rowing. And I'm happy to kind of get into all that is the athlete council, but would love, yeah, Grace and Dariush to talk about who they are first. Thanks, Sarah. Grace, do you want to go next? So yeah, I'm Grace Latz. I was a walk-on athlete originally at Wisconsin and then worked my way into the club scene. Um, I rode for Vesper Boat Club and CRC for a short time um, before joining the training center in 2013. I was on the 2014 women's quad that um, got bronze at the world championships, um, 2015 women's straight four, and the 2016 uh, women's quad at the Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. And then uh, ended my career in 2017 in the women's eight. So four years there on the national team, a variety of experiences, um, left the sport in 2018. And like Sarah, it's nice to be able to come back and kind of, I've stayed in touch with a lot of my national team teammates and it, it's great for me to be kind of one of these at large members, um, board appointed. And, um, I've, I've been enjoying this role to kind of give back to a system that I, I would have wanted to train in. And it's very it's a very exciting time. All right. And Dariush, let's turn this over to you. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Amanda. I'm Dariush. I'm the male athlete rep on the board, um, vice chair of this athlete council, and have been with the national team for about a decade, maybe just short. Grew up rowing in Chicago. I'm also a Badger uh, with Grace. Um, did some club time in Philly and then um, was with the national team for quite a while. A um, few teams, few medals, um, and then most recently uh, took some time off to nurse an injury and saw an opportunity to give back to my athletes, my fellow athletes. And so here I am. That's great. And Sarah, I'm going to bring it back over to you for a minute to talk about what it is the Athlete Council does, um, who sits on the council, why it exists, why it was formed, um, and what the broader mission of the council is. Sure. Yeah. So it is, it is a very exciting newly formed council. And this is actually coming from the USOPC as a mandate across all national governing bodies. So every entity now has to have an athlete run council that acts as the liaisons really between the athlete population and all relevant parties within the organization. So we look at ourselves really as the in between channel between the national team athletes, the board of directors and the US rowing staff. We help to elevate their voices and ensure that our 
important issues are being brought to the table and are being considered and thoroughly thought through. Um, the, the fun part about it is how we've slated this athlete council, which the USOPC did give every national governing body a little bit of leeway in terms of how they were going to do that. So we landed on a 10 athlete council where we are filling eight of our slots from athlete elected positions that are dual positions. So that's like Dariush and I, we're both sitting on the board of directors as athlete reps. And there are four of us that do that currently. There's two female board athlete reps and two male uh, athlete reps on the board that also sit on this athlete council. We've also pulled four of our HPC reps. Two of those are our HPC reps on the senior HPC. Right now that's um, Jevy and Liam, so Jevy Stone and Liam Corrigan. And then we also have the two para HPC reps. So they sit on our council as well, which brings us to eight. And we had two other positions that we could fill to round out our council with any group that we felt was underrepresented or we needed a little bit more of a well-rounded perspective. That's Grace. Grace helps to fill one of those at-large positions. We also have Maddie Wanamaker on as a second at-large position, which brings us to 10. And we're meeting quite regularly as a group to discuss what we want to help improve, uh, big important items that are asking basically for the athlete input. And right now we're very busy with everything going on in selection and international competition, helping to ensure that that process is moving smoothly, that athletes who have issues have a resource to be able to lean on, uh, and that we're really able to help this team get to September and the World Championships in a super strong and hopefully very successful position. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, HPC is the High Performance Committee, right? So we have one for um, power, the power team, the senior team, and the junior team, uh, some of the listeners might not know all of the acronyms. And of course, USOPC is the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. So um, thank you for that, Sarah. I'd love to shift over to um, hearing about hearing from each of you a little bit about your experience as an athlete and what how that informs your role um, as, as a member of the Athlete Council. Having having been through this experience, no one can um, you know, I can imagine, for example, what you all have have in, have experienced, but there's nothing like having lived it. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you're bringing? Each of you are bringing from that experience to this role. And Darius, I'll I'll put you on the spot first. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think that's probably why a lot of us are here, and a lot of us why a lot of us are doing this is I think we're we're drawing that ex, uh, inspiration directly from our experience and. Um, I think I, I had um, the good fortune of, I, I feel like, hitting all, um, all, all ends of, of an athlete experience on the national team. I kind of had the highest of the highs, um, some medals, you know, uh, world championships, world records, and the lowest of the lows of not making teams, you know, being, being uh, not where I want to be, not making certain boats, um, all the way to injury knocking me out. And so I think I have a good perception of, like, what that landscape is. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, it's been a U.S. Rung's had an interesting path up to your time here, Amanda, as you know. And I think that, like, with all the awesome adjustments and changes we're making, I think the athletes was one that really needed to be uh, um, tended to. And I think as an athlete, there, were, there, weren't our, there wasn't always an outlet for us to speak to. There was no one to really go to if there was an issue. It was just you, know, you have your coaches, you have your teammates. And so I think it was a bit limiting. And so um, I was excited when this was introduced and we started talking about it um, to just be there for the athletes and empathize with where they're at, what needs to be done, how we can help them, how we can help communicate things better. Because ultimately, everyone's trying to reach the same goal. It's success you know, for themselves, for their country, and so on. But I think, you know, better communication and better organization can get us there. And um, I think being a recent athlete, you know, it's sure it's good to be, uh, it, it's, it's good to know some of the current athletes, but it's also nice to have like an idea of what the current system is, because, you know, a decade ago, two decades ago, it was much different. And so as things change, I think it's good, good to have an idea of where we're going, you know, what they're, what they're experiencing, what they 
you know, may be sensing is coming, the pressures and whatnot, and, and be there to kind of help them communicate, you know, to the coaches, to the high performance committee, to us throwing at large, what's going, what could be better? How can we all feel better about this path forward? Yeah. And I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit more, Darius. What, what stops athletes from, I know the answer to this. Um, what stops athletes? I think I do from going directly to, you know, the head of high performance or the CEO or the board. I mean, so what's what's important about them being able to come directly to the AC members? There is a there is a dynamic between coach and athlete, right? That's that's, you know, um, obvious. I think there's the dynamic is needed change here at U.S. Rowing. And I think that that's something that we're all excited to make that change. I think it's been largely not a great dynamic. I think in general on the national team, there haven't been clear protocols and processes as to how you make boats and how you move forward and how you become successful. And so now uh, U.S. Rowing and with you know your leadership, we've started to develop that. We brought in Yossi. We have a plan. How are these things going to unravel? But I think there's a lot of uh, experiences that the athletes can recall from previous cycles where they're they're still used to this dynamic of well, there's just there's just one person making all the decisions. So I don't want to, you know, if I have something wrong, if I have an injury, if I had a bad day, or if I don't like how this process is going, I see another angle to it. I think in the past, no one's been comfortable to go to this one decision maker and potentially, you know, open up a can of worms. Whereas now, you know, there's a process in place. You know, I think everyone wants to hear what everyone's experiencing as an athlete. Like what, you know, what is your point of view? How can we help you understand what you need to do, what's required of you to make a boat, make a team, et cetera. And so I think essentially we, we need to shift away from this um, subjective uh, one person kind of dictates and chooses all things to, OK, here's a process. Here's uh, our um, procedure of how to make the teams and how to be successful. And then our athlete council is there to kind of make sure everyone understands what those things are. Grace, let's bring it to you to talk about your experience as an athlete. What are you bringing from that experience directly over to this leadership role within U.S. Rowing? So similar to Dariush, I was I was a club rower on the outside after um, graduating college. I was at the Princeton Training Center. Um, I was in Olympic boat classes. I was in non-Olympic boat classes. I ended with an injury with overtraining syndrome and um, you know, I felt oftentimes I loved the life of kind of living a little bit like a monk and dedicating my life to rowing circles, um, on Mercer and Carnegie. But I, I think I was frustrated at times with the process, um, or just the experience from A to B. Like I still got a lot of medals. Like I still, you know, had an objectively successful career, but I, I think there's a new era of athletes are, that are just demanding a little bit more. And like Dario said, I didn't, I think in my time, I was frustrated that there wasn't an outlet to express these things because athletes are smart. They're not just robots. Um, they know, I think we're valuing athletes intuition and they, they're, they know physiology, they know headspace, like this increased awareness of mental, mental health. Like they, they know what they need to get faster and they're well-rounded people with lives and grades and family and whatnot. And it, it was frustrating to not always feel like you had a space to say, Hey, I actually need this to happen. Um, I need this resource. I need access to that. And not just a, a me, me, me thing, but at a team level too. And so it's nice to have sort of a, a bit of coaching up instead of coaching down um, within the system. I, I, the exciting thing about this is that athletes have a place to design a system that will get fast boats um, and they're, they're happy while they do it. And I think that's um, a pretty special situation to find ourselves in. And it's really, I think, assisting creating a well-rounded athlete, both on and off the water. Get fast boats and happy while you do it. I like that. Yeah. Fast <laughs> athletes. I mean, <laughs> happy. I mean, you know, fast athletes are, are also most of the time happy and, and they'll have long careers. we will have re better retention. Mm -hmm. um, I think that makes a more colorful career. Yeah, you were going to jump in. Yeah, I think Grace nailed it. I think balance is the name of the game. We're like the sports changing. There's new generations. I think uh, rowing has been stuck in this like Bobby Knight era of of coaching and, and dictating and it's all all pain, you know, no gain. And and uh, and I think that's changed and, and Grace nailed it. It's about balance. You see it in every other professional sport. They it's it's a, it's a comprehensive approach. 
mental health, physical well-being, rest. And that's not to say that you have to cut out the intensity of the sport. I don't think that even if we wanted to, we could in American rowing. And it's valuable. It's sport. It needs to be intense, but it needs to be balanced. And Grace nailed it. I think like in the modern era, like we have access to everything online and on our phones and we see how other athletes and professional athletes function. And that's not by, you know, you know, being stuck on one machine, being yelled at, you know, and, and all the time it's, it's, it's a, it's a balanced approach. You know, can I move a boat? Can I train effectively? Do I have balance in my life? Where's my head at? Do I understand my goals? Like those things are so important. And, um, I think it's, it's exciting to be able to embrace that. Sarah, do you want to, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I mean, just listening to Grace and Daryush talk, this is why I'm so excited to have them on the athlete council and to be working with them because we have a lot of really smart, thoughtful athlete reps that are dedicating their time for free to do this. And it just makes me even more passionate to talk about this stuff. But I would just echo a lot of what they said. I am a huge believer that wellness and performance do not need to live independently of one another. And in fact, they do better when they are working together and in tandem. And I think that that's something that we've gotten wrong in the past is thinking that it has to be one or the other and you have to live in an extreme. And I absolutely lived in that performance extreme where nothing else mattered except for trying to make a team and to win. And my wellness absolutely suffered because of that. And after retiring from sport, I had years of building myself back up to do in order to become a functioning human being. And I don't want our national teamers to ever have to experience that. And I don't think they have to. And I actually believe that they will perform better if we give them the resources they need to combine those two pillars. And not only will they perform better while they are an active athlete, but also once they are a retired human. So I think that's probably where I'm the most passionate about all of this. But I'd also add... I ran out of resources when I was an athlete. You know, I I rode in the camp system and I also rode in the trial system. I had to leave the Princeton Training Center because I ran out of resources to try and help get me healthy. And I want to ensure that athletes who either face injury or other hardships along their way know what resources are available to them and actually have direct access to those so that they have multiple options and they don't have to just pick a route by default because nothing else is there. Um, And then the last thing I I think I would add is our pipeline, because I found the national team at the U23 level, and really only because I was rowing at Princeton University and the training center was in our same locker room. So I was surrounded by those women, and it sort of fell on my lap, like, oh, this could be an opportunity for me, and maybe I should try it. But we are now at this 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 time where we're able to actually look at that pipeline and we have leaders like you and Yossi who are doing that very thoughtfully and thinking about how do we get more athletes involved at a younger age and make sure that they're brought through the entire process. They're aware of these standards and they have a guide throughout all of that. So really we're helping to impact that experience from when you're first picking up an oar, when you're a junior athlete, and then as you come through the collegiate system and the U23 system, and then potentially the senior team and making an Olympics, right? That we could we could improve our talent pool so great greatly just by improving that athlete experience across every single stage of, of the journey. Yeah, absolutely. I I I wonder if any of you have anything to add around um you know, specifically what you want to bring to the athletes through your, your roles in the, on the athlete council, you've touched on some really good points already. Uh, is there anything else you want to see in terms of change for, for their, for their journey, their experience that, that we haven't already talked, or you haven't already talked about? One thing that I think Sarah just mentioned, um, that I, I don't think I realized until this moment that all three of us have in common is injury and the support around it. Um, the, the limited staff that us rowing has, um, you know, Mark Novak has been incredible for years. Deirdre McLaughlin, um, has been another incredible asset, but that's, you know, that's two physical therapists for how many athletes and, and there's a revolving door of other wonderful people that I'm not mentioning, but you know, they're, they're only, you know, they can only do so much. And a lot of times an injury was a death sentence. And that is something that absolutely needs to change. And I know, all three of us and the rest of the athlete council, it's something that we think of a lot and, you know, preventative measures as well. You know, it's, 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 (laughs) 
we should be encouraging everyone to be taking care of their bodies and stretching and doing all those all those active things that I think for a long time were looked at as like, you know, overkill or weakness to be constantly, you know, you're an athlete, you know, your body is your business. And it's super important that we treat it as such. And I think that's something that it's really important should be highly encouraged uh, amongst the, all the athletes. I was going to say, yeah, kind of piggybacking off of that. I think of my athlete experience or when I talk to other athletes as like, how are we keeping the ball rolling? How are we keeping the car moving forward with these wagon wheels of wellness? And so just like Dario said, the athletes in the center and you've got you've got your coach, you've got the high performance instructor, but you also have sports psychs, you have physiologists, you have you know, all these other things that contribute to your experience. You have your job, you have these other things. And how can we keep that all balanced and rolling equally? And it's not a lopsided wheel so that the athlete stays in the center and the athlete keeps moving forward. And I think that, you know, there's those resources that we're talking about. Cause yeah, same thing. Overtraining syndrome could have been prevented or mitigated where I didn't have to end my career when I did, but it really exposed to me these other parts of my wheel that weren't complete. And I'm very motivated to make sure that other people have complete wheels and a full set to go full speed, free speed. Um, and I think a big part of that has to deal with what are, you've heard us say, it, like communication, letting athletes know that they have resources. You know, they might walk into a club, um, they might walk into a training center, and we want them to be able to know what they have available to them while they're on this path to be an Olympic hopeful, because they may come from a collegiate system where a lot of that was kind of taken care of for them. But now we're dealing with an athlete ha- that has to be more independent and a little bit more resourceful. And we want to be able to communicate and help them make those connections so that they can keep, they can keep centered on their path. Yeah. I love all that, Grace. And the one thing I would just add to that as well is I think we're finally now with, with Yossi in place as our high performance director, seeing an acceptance of the fact that there is more than one way up the mountain. And in the past, it has been, if you don't fit into the system that's been created, you are not invited to be part of it. And he is now really recognizing and celebrating that every athlete is different. That's from a physiological perspective. That's from a mental and emotional, a family units perspective. Everybody has a different set of criteria that they need to work around. And he's willing to to solve for those different solutions and for those different individual needs where we really haven't been able to do that in the past. And what that's going to allow us to do is to retain talent, right? Because Yossi has very clearly set his goals as what he wants to see across our team's performance, but also across our athletes' uh, life cycle as a national teamer. And one of those things is to retain for more than one Olympic cycle. I, I, you know, it's, we saw so many amazing talented athletes retire after just one cycle because they didn't fit into the system and, or not even, or not even make a team. Right. right, because they just didn't fit into how what we were focusing on in those few years, and you saw these awesome athletes just get abandoned and lose hope and move on. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you, but you're on no, the money. Mm-hmm. You're right, and and I mean, look, we're early on in this cycle. It's a weird cycle. It's a three year cycle. We're all, I think, at the stage where we're very excited about the progress that has been made. And I mean, we go to this World Cup and we bring home seven medals. And now we've just won gold in two Henley events recently on the on the senior uh, national team. So we're all sort of in this moment of like holding our breath. Like, I think this is working. Maybe we're on the right track, but we have to wait and see because World Championships isn't until September. And then all of a sudden we're in the Olympic year. So, or the pre-Olympic year, right? So it's it's coming up fast and I'm really enthusiastic about all this. We have a ton more work to do and we're also really looking you know, ahead beyond just Paris and also to LA. Um, and, and this group in particular, as the Athlete Council, is trying to set the foundations that will be in place well beyond our terms, right? We're going to term out at different points and we're going to have to have other people come and fill our places and hopefully continue the momentum of what we've been working on. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's hard not to be positive and enthusiastic about the change that we've seen, even just in the six months that we've been up and running. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with that more, Sarah. So you all have been talking about the role that athlete council plays and the, you know, really for the athletes to be able to come to somebody who has, has been through this experience who can be trusted when there are, um, questions, issues, concerns, uh, Sarah, I'm probably going to give this one to you. How, how do you maintain confidentiality? How do athletes know when I bring this issue to Sarah or somebody else on the athlete council, how do I know it doesn't go 
um, you know, straight back to a coach or a selector or, or whomever. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, it's a really great and important question. And I think if we look back on the way that our high performance program has functioned over the previous few cycles and, and we're really critical of ourselves, we will know that this is an area that has failed in the past. And so confidentiality has been a really, really important part of how we have built this athlete grievance process. Uh, the only way to ensure that that really stays tight is to ensure that there's a single point person for grievances. So the way that we've built this system is that all athlete problems come to the chair of the athlete council and that person only um, is able to see their name and the specifics around that complaint. Right now, that's me. If there were ever to be a case where an athlete did not feel comfortable coming to me, then the backup person is Dariush as our vice chair and the backup to Dariush is Grace as our secretary, right? But the system and the intake form that will be published very shortly on our website, if it's not already, um, allows for only a single point person to be able to take in those, those complaints. And I have been on the opposite side of that in the past where I didn't feel comfortable that my name would be kept uh, really confidential or that the specifics of my situation wouldn't be shared to a place where it was really obvious who the complaint was coming from. Um, and so we're being incredibly sensitive to that. And I think building the relationships with our athletes is probably the most important part of all of that is actually being a truly trusted source that then does what they say they're going to do um, so that their actions are speaking louder than their words. Um, the chair of the athlete council is not always going to be me. At some point, it will be somebody else and that they will have that same role to, to fill and that same importance of maintaining confidentiality. But it's an area that we're all really committed to and we don't take that lightly. And when we have meetings, we are really serious about ensuring that we're not talking about individual athletes unless it's under a confidential scenario. Um, so yeah, I'm, I think we're, we're really doing this the right way now. Um, and we want athletes to know that we are truly a, a source that you can come to and not be worried about where your concerns may leak to. That's great. And really helpful. Thank you. I want to shift for a moment. I know that the three of you or the athlete council is laser focused as it should be on the, the national team and, and the wellness and the speed, um, success all around of the national team and the athletes. I wonder though, for each of you. Where do you see a connection between the rest of rowing in this country? So the other 99.9% um, who maybe have aspirations, maybe not, but who are not a part of the national team, but just love this sport and get so much from the sport. Do you see a, any connections between those who are at the very top of the sport, some in the world and, you know, eighth graders learning to row, um, 50 year old women getting in a boat for the first time. I mean, do you see any connections there? I, I the biggest one I see is it, it hit me. I think as I, you know, I, I stepped away from rowing is I realized I look back at my career and I've been rowing since I was in high school. And what I realize is the culture of American rowing is often dictated from how the national team functions. And you see that, you know, uh, a lot of how the men and women's team performed the late nineties, early two thousands, it dictated how American rowing is, uh, you know, permeated, it's permeated into the, the collegiate teams, the high school teams. I mean, I've been hearing the same language, the same style of rowing and everything since I was 13 years old. And it wasn't until I got to the senior team and rode for a few particular coaches where I was like, oh man, here is, this is where this came from. This is where it comes from. This is where it yeah. come, came from. Yeah. And, and it's, they had success. And so it permeated the rest of American rowing and that's great, but their sport is changing and we need to make sure that, you know, the, the, the culture of rowing in the U.S. is changing along with the national team, if that makes sense. And I think, again, I mentioned it previously, I think, you know, 20 something years ago, it's, you know, who had the big erg? That was it, you know, that and that it changed American rowing. And it, you see it because even, you know, 15 years ago when I was in high school, a good erg score to get into college. Well, shoot, your kids are 20 seconds faster now. Kids are pulling, uh, you know, national team scores in high school. So. That, that that's changed. And I think there's a, now a new focus to what we've now talked about, um, a well-rounded approach, movement boats, athlete wellness, like professional sports, you know, rowing, we, we don't want to be caught behind. You see it in other countries. They do a good job of this balance and they're the ones that are successful. So I think as a national team, it's important that we embrace these things and we'll find success. We will. I'm confident of it. 
And hopefully that then permeates the culture in all the positive ways. I love how you said that. And it trickles down and around, doesn't it? I, I'm, I'm afraid to use the, the phrase trickle down, but yes. <laughs> well, I would, yeah. say, I would say maybe like <laughs> trendsetters or influencers, Yeah, you know, because yeah. it's the shiny stuff with the gold medals and all the surely, surely the path that leads to all of this shiny, beautiful stuff is completely amazing. Um, but sometimes there's shadows to those gold medals that we don't often see if you're not um, walking that path. And I think it's healthy for people to understand when they watch an Olympics or something like that. that there's a huge backstory to how people got there. And, you know, a lot of those people go on to become coaches or sit in positions like this because of their experience. And it does, like Darius say, said, um, informs a wider rowing experience. And um, I, I would say the same thing, you know, with the focus on eights and, you know, with now with the system being more fitting the boats to the athletes, like we're going to see a lot of changeover, I think, and where we perform well at the top level, but also access lower, you know, like where we're going to have more singles and doubles and sculling and, you know, smaller boats going on, maybe more pop up clubs that can support doing a, a junior level event in in a double, you know, whereas before they weren't on the map. Um, and be competitive and have fun and do that kind of thing and have access to more of these boat classes. Um, so yeah, I, I would just like to say that maybe we're just trendsetters. <laughs> yeah, but I agree with all of that. It's exactly true. There is an effect from the top down and I don't think it's been a positive one for a while. And I, and I, I know I might come out and have a lot of people disagree with me on that one, but I look at women's collegiate rowing as an example of this my my sister went to college and rode. She was Big Ten Athlete of the Year. And I don't know if I looked back on all this, if I would have encouraged her to row, um, if I wasn't in the position that I'm in now to try to make some change. Because what we saw happen is that there was a national team trickle effect where erg scores and win at all costs has been funneled down the system. And you see all of these young broken rowers from a really young age when that is not what we should be creating. And we should be creating a love of sport, a love of pursuing high performance and progress uh, for who you are as a person to whatever potential that ends up being, not with injury as a normal byproduct of that process and being able to take the sport as long as you want and not ending up blowing your back out and not being sure what you're ever going to be able to participate in for the rest of your life, right? Like we want these active humans who can take on whatever part of activity that they want later on in their life, uh, whether that be rowing or something else. And I don't think that we're, we have been for several years actually enabling that to happen. So I'm hopeful that we're going to make some of these changes at the national team level, prioritizing that intersection of wellness and performance. And it will have this effect down at the collegiate and the junior level where we can see athletes come in more well-rounded with more perspective, understanding that they don't just need to perform today. They need to perform tomorrow and the next day and next year. And they need to be taking care of their bodies 10, 20 years from now as well. And it's not really worth an at all cost type of mentality um, unless you're really in a very, very small percentage. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about all of the way that this, this can really have a larger impact, but also in the way that it, it will, it will create this really natural, I'm, I'm hopeful of this, a natural impact to those early rowers of being able to see what these people look like and that they are somebody that I want to become from this full, well-rounded perspective and then get interested in, in rowing at an earlier age. I mean, our teammates did not look very diverse and we're now trying to expand who has access to this sport and who gets excited about the person that they can become through this sport. And I think that there is opportunity for that as well. I was going to say, you know, I think we don't, we talk a lot about physical injury because that's, you know, you can't row if your body can't do it. But I think also sort of a mental injury, there's a huge mental toll on pursuing this path. And I think having um, this more well-rounded approach or the wagon wheel of wellness that I keep, that's how I visualize it in my brain. Um, you're going to have people who come out of the sport who are still excited about the sport and they can give back right away. You know, we've, I think we've encountered, you know, we have had a mixed bag of experiences, but we still have this passion and we see people who want, who are our teammates from years ago and they're a little hesitant to participate because they feel a little burned. And, they're still healing from that. And 
I think, you know, just like the teammates that we are, even though we might not still be holding an oar, we're still bringing each other together. And I hope that this system is from top down is a more empathetic system, a more a higher EQ sort of situation that comes down to an individual club level, um, t- just like Sarah said, to be more open, to be to have more access, to, un- to meet people where they're at and bring them along, you know, and I think that that's one of my big hopes that comes out of this. I feel like I have to say for, you know, anyone uh, essentially a, a Gen Z or prior. So anyone who graduated before, let's say like 2005 and, and existed in the rowing world, they're probably scoffing at this like, oh, this millennial balance kind of um, dialogue. And it's not to say I think all of us know it's not to say we, 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 the, the goal is to cut out any sort of, you know, uh, intensity or aggression of the sport. I mean, that's the beauty of the sport. And, you know, those are the intangibles that are so important. You know, they're so, so important. And honestly, that was some of the most fun I had, you know, being aggressive, being competitive and racing. And it's, that's still a focus. It's just as I think we're all highlighting really well, it's got to be balanced because, you know, it, 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 that, um, you know, s- s- I forget what the term you use, Sarah, but, but selling it all for that one moment, it rarely panned out, you know, it's only a few athletes. And I think that there's a few stories out there. There's like these legendary figures that had a little bit of success and people hang on to these one stories I did, you know, and I was fortunate to meet some of these people and you talk to them and it's like, Oh, there's a whole history there. It wasn't just that one erg score. They sold their soul and they pulled it and then they had the success. Like there's a lot more to it. And so that balance is super important and it's just as important as that aggression that competitive nature, you know, and that all of that. So I don't think ever, I, I think, yes, some people will scoff, but I think <laughs> there's some really critical people who will not. Um, and I think most importantly, Yozi <laughs> will not. Um, and I, I want to put out there, I, I believe he graduated after 2004. <laughs> um, maybe I'm not sure. And, uh, and that's the key person here, right? Uh, we're we're following his lead and that's why he was he was brought in right because we believed in that model and a a different path to get there um so i i i'm so glad that you're all talking about this and being honest about where we've been because you've been there um and where we're going and that's what's so exciting and so possible because of you all and you know this conversation wouldn't be complete if I didn't take a moment to really express such gratitude to all of you for the time you're volunteering. I mean, just two weeks, uh, who knows when it was recently, um, there was an incident in our, in our high performance world where there were some athletes who were affected and it was a holiday weekend. And Sarah, I don't want to embarrass you, but you spent the greater part of that weekend personally doing outreach to athletes and getting them on the phone. And, you know, I can send out an email, you know, saying we're expressing concern, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing replaces um, that personal outreach from somebody who is an athlete who can show empathy and care and listen. And that is just, um, that's what this is all about. So really just on behalf of us rowing, I'm just so incredibly grateful. And whenever I think about the, the national team now and think about all of those athletes, men, women, para, um, all of them, I think, uh, first in my head, I think, thank God for Yosi. This is the, in this order. And then I say, thank, thank God for the athlete council. Um, because it wouldn't be we wouldn't be making the changes that we are and sort of reinventing this um, high performance at us rowing if it weren't for, for you all. Um, Sarah, did you want to add to any of that or? Well, no, I just, I mean, I wanted to thank you for that too. I mean, I think we're all very, really excited to be working with you and, and appreciate the fact that you've stayed true to your vision for the past 18 months that you've been on. Um, but I, I would also say like all, all 10 of these athlete reps were all volunteering. Everyone's doing an amazing job. And I did not know who my athlete reps were when I was training. And if that's the case still, then we're failing at our jobs. So we're working really hard to make sure that we're visible to this community and to the athletes to know that we are here. And if there's two things that I want everybody to take away from this, it's that we are here to be a communication point. So if you have a question about your athlete 
experience, come to us and ask and we will find the answer for you. And the other part being if you have a problem, you have a complaint or a grievance or a real issue that needs solving, come to us and we will help you navigate the system of how to have that solved. Those are our really two biggest missions and important roles right now. And just having people know who we are is where we need to start. So thank you for even giving us this this platform to be able to introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about how passionate we are, um, because I think that that really is the most important piece of this puzzle in order for us to to keep that momentum going. And that's a good segue. I, we can include it in the show notes. Um, but is there a is there a, an email to use or phone number? Yes. So all of our emails are published on the U.S. Rowing website. There is a now an Athlete Council page that you can find the minutes from our meetings and our charter and our leadership role descriptions and everything about what we're working on. Um, we're also going to be in person at Head of the Charles this year. We're going to have an in-person meeting with the 10 of us. And then there will be some sort of in-person activation that if you keep an eye on the newsletters and the, the social media channels, we will make sure they're pumped out there as well. We'd love to meet the community in person. Um, but I would say that that page on the U.S. Rowing website is definitely the best place to start. Super. Thank you. Um, I'd never end this podcast without asking the same question. And I love that you're all rowers because, you know, it is specifically tailored to rowers. Um, each of you, if you can tell us you've had a really hard row, you're coming in, what are you going to eat? And you don't need to make it. You don't need to, but it just, it's there for you. So don't, don't take that into consideration. Um, Grace, are you ready, Grace? Yeah. I'm and you ready. go first or do you need a minute? I go to, okay. I go, I usually go to bed hungry waiting for what I'm going to eat before and after practice. So this was pretty fast. If I, if I'm doing, uh, I think the right answer is for me to say a breakfast burrito, but in actuality, sometimes it's a brownie, like a fudgy brownie that I store in my car. <laughs> so it's nice and warm when I get off the water. Grace, um, yeah. Really? Know. Well, you know, you, and you know, sometimes I might nibble on it before the practice be like, well, dessert first in case this practice goes, uh, south. So, <laughs> and then I'm like, Oh, okay, it's fine. I'll eat the rest of the brownie when I'm off the water. <laughs> I like the honesty though. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Darius. I feel like it's uh location dependent, you know, when I was in college, it was like, there was, you finish your Saturday row and grace remember this, you go to like Mickey's dairy bar. And mm -hmm. I mean, everything on their menu is you order, you know, a scrambler for instance, and it's probably a dozen eggs and like, you know, a pound of sausage in it and you'd eat your weight and that yes. and then go sleep. You know, if I were in Princeton, it was probably, well, I had probably two spots, either a Hoagie Haven or like a Wawa stop. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, wh whatever it was, was like probably some sort of breakfast. Yeah. Like at least six eggs involved. <laughs> That's why it's so much fun to ask rowers this question. It gets awkward when someone is like, I don't know, nothing really. <laughs> yeah. Food <laughs> is the best part of training. Can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's the it's the it's the you know prize for a, a really hard row. I like this theme that you just started, Darius. So I'm going <laughs> to lean into that. I would say my favorite post row meal would be the uh, breakfast sandwich that the guys at Olives in Princeton basically had waiting for yes. us when we walked in the door because they knew exactly what our orders were. And then you'd pop over next door and you'd get a delicious small world coffee. So yep. those two paired together are basically the greatest combo the, breakfast I could dream up. <laughs> yeah, the, the BBB, the best breakfast burrito was my order at that place every time I'd come off the water. I got to say, I think we just <laughs> we just made the distinction between men and women's team. Hoagie Haven, Wawa <laughs> versus Olives. If you know the places, you'll understand. The women are a little bit more refined. <laughs> we got to get the men's team a nutritionist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. All right. Well, uh, now that we know what you all like to eat after a row, we're going to wrap this up and, and thank you all so much for those of you who haven't spent time with you. Uh, they should definitely find you at the U S rowing 10 at the head of the Charles. We'll have that set up. Uh, and then we will link the other information in the show notes and really appreciate, uh, the work that I get to do with all of you and your time with us this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you for having us and thank you for making time to have the Athlete Council have a little bit of a voice here. You guys are good. And that's all for this episode of The Swing of Things. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the invaluable work done by the U.S. Rowing Athlete Council. 
Join us next time when we meet our U19 and U23 rowers as they prepare for their world championships in Varese, Italy. Remember to like, share, and follow from wherever you get your podcasts. It helps others to find us. And please subscribe to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Thanks for listening.